Phil is the uh, is the president and owner of Brassica Corps Ltd. and comes from Alberta, Canada. And you know, Phil literally wrote the manual on canola production. So we're real fortunate to have Phil here with us today. He's a great communication communicator, and you know, his expertise is known not only in, in Canada but throughout the world. So. Um, Phil, we'll try to get you lined up here in terms of where your stuff is. Good morning, everyone. It's a, a pleasure that your planning committee invited me back here. I've always enjoyed the uh, last meeting that I was at. I do a lot of uh, third world work as a, a volunteer expert. So I get to speak at meetings in South Africa and China and India and uh, occasionally Saskatchewan and the US. You missed that one. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to talk about something that's rather different. I do come from the Great White North. This is my yard in the middle of December. We've had 50 inches of snow. A lot of shoveling on my acreage just to get into that driveway. <laughs> uh, we have Canadian archaeology. It's always a, a fun thing when we get that much snow. It's very rare, though. I threw this slide in just to show you uh, what can happen. Some of this land that you're looking at is winter canola. They grow three crops a year on this land. Uh, the total requirement is about 540 days for maturity of the three crops. And they're doing it in one year. And a lot of the land has been farmed for over a thousand years and still very productive. The reason they can do that with the canola, it's transplanted. So they're putting in a plant that's already this big and it shortens down their maturity situation. They do have issues. Uh, we're, I've walked a lot of fields over there that organic matters, 1%, 1.5%. They need to build it up and uh, they try, but it's, it's quite difficult because they pull all the residue off this land. Every bit of it's utilized in some means or fashion. I've shown this many, many times over the last 25 years. There's over 140 factors that affect canola production or any other crop. Most of those in the red are biotic, uh, abiotic. The yellows were born with a soil type. We're not going to change it much over time. But we can, and I, was, I really like Dwayne's presentation on that. But what it is, is getting that, as Dwayne said, getting it into a systems approach and making sure we're doing all of those factors properly. If you don't do a lot of them, a huge number of them might only be 1% loss in yield. But there's a lot of them. And so you really want to look at trying to balance this system as best as possible. Uh, there's a lot of stress factors, and I, I like this because how can we eliminate a lot of the stresses that will cause yield loss? And they're constantly being hit by both abiotic and biotic stresses. And this is some work out of, uh, well, from the American Society of Plant Phys uh, Physiologists in 2000. It hasn't changed any. You look at the bottom line there, the red one at the bottom, that's the average yields, and they really haven't changed much in the last 10 years. But you look at where we should be. We should be moving that up to hit the full genetic potential. I don't have canola on there because that's a US paper, but uh, if you look at the soybean one in the center, it should be a bit higher because the highest yield I've ever seen in canola was actually in the U.S. at 171 bushels per acre. And you look at what causes most of our stress out there, it's abiotic stress. It's uh, saline situations, it's drought, heat, and light. And of course, the most important thing that uh, without this, we have no production. We're all dead. And like Dwayne said, we've got to have carbon dioxide, water, sunlight, to make the whole system work. And how do we make that the most efficient that we can possibly do? And it is photosynthesis, and how can we increase the photosynthetic 
uh, efficiency of our plants. Make them work better, and it comes back to balance again. Uh, life cycle. Uh, a lot of people don't really understand how a plant works. Like most plant life cycles possess, at the plant cell level, uh, everything is regulated by genes. And so we really are going to see some major changes in the near, near future because we've got a far better understanding of what's happening. And you look at those little chloroplasts in there, uh, they're part of that major system of converting that carbon dioxide and sunlight into a productive part, uh, product in the plant. And there's the uh, chloroplast where it all happens. And I'm not going to get into the Kelvin cycle or the Krebs cycle. Uh, it's been so long since I took that in university. But the main product out of that is, is first of all, sugars. And this just simplifies it. We've got photosynthesis making sugars at the bottom. Uh, some of that sugar is used in the Krebs cycle for making energy for the plant. Amino acids are produced. Uh, step three is proteins. And most of our signaling systems in plants are proteins. And, of course, there's carbohydrates and uh, translocation movement within the plant. Uh, you've got to think like a plant. I don't know the language very good. I, I have trouble thinking like a plant. But the fact is, we know very little about how a plant works. We're getting better at it, and uh, it's really changed over the last 10 years. Uh, we went from genomics. We now know exactly how many genes are in a canola plant or an Arabidopsis plant or a corn plant. Uh, we know how many genes are in people. And there's a lot of similarities between the research work that's being done between humans and plants. You know, if you don't have a good balanced diet, what's going to happen to your health? And the same thing works with plants. We've gone to proteinomics. It's what product does the gene make, or responsible, or regulate. And now we've got a whole brand new one called metabolomics. And that's really looking at those metabolites that are produced within the plant that help it grow and handle stress. And this is, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. It's really, we look at every step in the development of a plant, and the growth of a plant is regulated by genes all the vegetative growth, all the reproductive growth, and all the yield. All the yield factors are regulated by those genes. So we've got to have the right ones in a plant. Chemical composition. Most of the regulation there is done by genes that turn on and produce or have hormones produced. They're really the key signaling system within a plant. They're the ones that make the lignin in the plant. It's going to stand up better. It's the oil and protein in canola and carbohydrates and amino acids in other crops. Uh, photosynthetic efficiency. We want that plant to operate at the best level possible. And that means having adequate chlorophyll in the plant. There's too often when I walk into a plant and there's an imbalance of nutrients, what color is the plant? It sure isn't that dark green that we want and we have to have for good photosynthesis. And it ties in with water use management. And it's a, you, you start looking at water management within a plant, it's all regulated by genes and it's controlled very tightly by genes. And there are some breakthroughs in that, just recent scientific breakthroughs that will help us increase our water use efficiency. I saw it on some of the uh, sessions yesterday and it, we were hearing some good things about how to grow canola in the low rainfall zone and not once did I hear about water use efficiency and how we can improve it rather significantly. So those plant uh, signaling system, those genes produce the hormones, they're really basically macro proteins with snippets of RNA, and it's sent from cell to cell to cell in the phloem, or in the xylem, because there are signals sent from the roots to the leaves and vice versa. Uh, those signals are really in response 
to environmental stress, to abiotic stress, or biotic stresses, whether it's uh, how much nutrients are there. Are they adequate to supply the plant with the capability of producing all these different hormones? And of course, every growth stage is controlled that way. Uh, this is a nice slide because it shows some of the key hormone signals that we're dealing with. Cytokinins are very, very important for germination and emergence to get a plant up out of the ground fast. But the, really, the bottom line is really critical as well. How do, you, how do you get those hormones to act properly? They're cofactors. For example, with cytokinins, there's calcium in there. Uh, iron is required, magnesium, manganese, nitrogen, phosphor, zinc, and boron. They're absolutely necessary, and if any of these are short in the plant, it cannot work at the level of efficiency that we want to do. And it really does go through the growth stage. Every growth stage is triggered by genes. Uh, just to simplify, I always try to marry up these plant signaling systems with the nutrient load that is critical for those particular enzymes and uh, hormones. And I've added a few more in there. We're all on, we're all on steroids. Did you know that? You eat any brassica crop, it's got lots of brassica steroids in it. So do we. We produce brassica steroids to help our growth. And uh, canola happens to have quite a high level of uh, these steroids. So does broccoli, cauliflower, they're all related. But look at the different nutrient packages that are needed in that. And again, if it's short, you're going to have some problems on how fast that plant can grow and how efficient it is. For example, in seed germination, about the seed actually has to absorb somewhere between 35 and 45 percent of its weight uh, before it can start germination. But once it hits a certain level, a gene is triggered, and it starts producing hydrolytic enzymes that break down the stored oil because it's not up above the ground yet to make any photosynthesis. And of course, there's oxygen there for metabolism and growth. And it's aerobic uh, respiration. It allows the plant to get up out of the ground and start utilizing sunlight. And cytokinin, as I mentioned, is really, really important. And it's produced by the roots is very important and it's moved up through the phloem into the above part of the ground uh, plant and it is responsible for uptake of all the macronutrients. Uh, protein synthesis. If cytokinins aren't there, our protein levels will drop. Uh, and again, I'm looking at, okay, what nutrients? Nitri nitrates, sulfate, phosphate, stimulate cytokinin production. If, it, if you are missing some of those, you're not going to get the kind of reaction you want in the plant. And once it then moved up, we start seeing cytokinins produced in other parts of the plant as well. It's very involved in opening of stomata, little valves on all the leaves that control water efficiency. Uh, did you know plants are real good at math? <laughs> It's, uh, it's, they've got an internal clock, just like we do. Well, some of us. Some people don't have an internal clock. And these receptors within the plant, they're photoreceptors for red and blue light. And they basically tell the plant how much day length they have. But also, they're calculating. There's another signaling system in there that calculates how much starch is in the leaves before sunset. Because as soon as that sun isn't there, we have no more photosynthesis going on, and the plant starts starving. So it calculates how much starch is in that whole leaf structure of the plant, and it says, Oop, we don't have enough for eight hours a night or ten hours a night. We're going to have to manufacture more. And so they don't starve during the, the night. And this helps the plant grow in the dark. When it's making a lot of those proteins, it's doing it at night as well. Uh, 
We also know plants can see. As I said, they uh, look at blue and red. So if you're wearing a red jacket, like that young fellow over there, they can tell him when he comes in in the field. <laughs> and they have the ability of sensing the environment that they're in and adjust their morphology, their physiology, and phenotype because of that ability. Uh, they can react to a lot of different stimuli. I mentioned some of those. Most, a lot of them are, are uh, abiotic, but they will react to where you place your fertilizer. And we're seeing more and more where we take a real good look at the roots on where our placement and what our placement is doing to the rooting structure of the plant. And if you really want one of the best things to ever measure your yield, just go out there and dig up roots. Because the longer the root length, the higher your yield. It's directly correlated. And so we really have ignored the roots. We've played with above ground stuff and we've got to start looking, how do we get a root dominant plant that's going to shove down a, a root that's my height? That's about how far canola will put down roots if you have no compaction uh, or rock underneath. Plants can smell, and we see this frequently with willow trees where tent caterpillars come in to poplars and take off all the leaves, or on willows. And uh, these willow trees produce, well, a signal from a gene produces salicylic acid. And it makes the leaves taste bitter. Any of you that take aspirin know they don't taste all that great. Uh, but it makes, it makes a lot less uh, damage to the plant because uh, tent caterpillar, they'll march over to poplar trees and strip them down. But they also release it in the air as a phenol. And the plants nearby pick it up with their sensing receptors and they start producing salicylic acid as well. So it's, it, it's a movement out from the first plant. And this also works with uh, uh, lima beans and a few other things. Uh, wounded tomatoes, they make a different product. It's uh, methyl jasminate. And it's an alarm signal that plants are being attacked. And it's, it's definitely going to uh, make all the other wounded tomatoes start producing this and giving it some protection. Can we change that? Maybe we can find a mutant gene that will increase that. Uh, here's one that any of you that have ever grown a little plant called mimosa. You touch that plant and it wilts right now. It's that fast. It's just like that. So it's an electronic signal and I don't have that one figured out. Uh, another one that actually I, it, this plant learns too. Because if you do a touch on that plant every day, for about a week and a half, it's going to remember that, and it's not going to wilt. And it's a real neat uh, thing to experiment with. But the cockleburrow weed, we don't have too many of those in Western Canada. If you walked in and touched a cockleburrow just for a couple seconds, uh, for a couple days, it starts sending out ethylene, another very, very important hormone, and the plant dies but there's never enough of us to do that except in China. Uh, there's a lot of light uh, receptors in these plants. Uh, some detect, like you were talking about, shading and plant density. If you've got a fairly high density of plants, for canola, that's about 25 to 30 plants per square foot, it will cause those plants to grow taller. And so you're much more uh, likely to get lodging issues because the signal is an auxin. It's a hormone that makes it, tells it to grow. Hey, we got to go. I, I'm being shaded on. I don't like that. i got to go up. And we know there's 300 different uh, kinase proteins in canola with v many diverse functions and pathways. And they're all developed in that developmental and defense mechanisms of the plant. And we know that phosphorus is extremely important in that particular pathway. There's a lot of uh, pathways in a plant. We know the plants move, don't we? You've all seen sunflowers, middle of the day, they're just pointing right at the sun and they slowly move as the sun goes. Uh, same with the Venus flytrap. There's the life cycles of canola. 
And every one of those stages are controlled by plant signals. It knows when to shift. Uh, for example, uh, we get those little plants come up out of the ground in Canada and they will bud really fast because they need 10 to 12 hours of sunlight. And by the time they're up out of the ground in May in Alberta, we were already at that. And the plant will start producing the reproductive stage very early. However, in Australia, it's a different story. Uh, we use growing degree days. It's a very high correlation uh, with each growth stage. So when it hits a certain growth stage, the gene's turned on, it starts a whole different process within the plant. However, I borrowed one of uh, John's research papers when I was in South Africa. Uh, it's a poor picture, but it, it tells you real close. They were growing uh, spring type as a winter in Australia and in Ottawa. It was a spring type as a summer crop. And you'll see the line is very straight. It's a high correlation. Now, the difference is in Ottawa, the maturity is 80 days. In Australia, it's 180 days. It takes an awful lot longer because they're into short day lengths. So this, I love this, John, because these photothermal uh, units is a far better measurement uh, than growing degree days. Because light, we know light has an impact. I've seen spring canola out of Canada, a variety of canola in India. It started flowering when it got this high because they were growing a spring as a winter and there was not enough daylight to trigger the growth stage to start flowering. <laughs> I don't want to harvest something that big. Uh, in the reproductive stage, uh, boron is absolutely essential. Uh, this may be a bit confusing, but those plant receptors is telling how much day length and growing degree days have happened. So it's measuring both uh, light and it's measuring how much heat it's had. And it's accumulation of heat. And what it does is it causes an FT gene in all the leaves to start making an FT protein that's a signal. It goes from the phloem of, from the leaves to the phloem and goes to the rest, to the growing tip of the plant. And when it hits the growing tip, it combines with another activated gene that produces an FD gene. So now you've got a FT and an FD combined signal and it goes to exactly the growing point and it triggers undifferentiated uh, cells to start forming reproductive cells that make the buds. And it happens fairly quickly. Uh, here's canola sex. Once in a while we have to talk about sex. This is an immature bud and you can see the yellow line there for the stigma. That's where all the seeds are going to come from. And little immature anthers where the pollen's going to come from. When that flower opens, it only takes two to three days for pollen to start being produced by the anthers. And they will land on that stigma. In Brassica and Napus that you're all growing, it is self-pollinated. It will only, it, probably 85% of all the seed produced is going to be pollinated by pollen from the same plant. Uh, those anthers mature, release the pollen. The stigma that's going to have all the seeds in a pod has an adhesive on it that those pollen grains stick. They have no water in them. They have no nutrients in it. It has to absorb from the stigma. And pollen lands, and you can see uh, you're getting lots of them on that stigma with the waxy leaf coating. And we figured it out. It takes about 100 grains of pollen to be able to fertilize all the ovules on the, on, in the, that are potential in the pod. And they grow rather rapidly on the bottom left there. There's a signaling system that is absolutely critical. It's called GABA. Uh, it's a great big long chemistry name, but it triggers pollination. And boron is a precursor for making this particular signal. And so the, the first ovule at the bottom, it sends out this GABA signal. The pollen grain at the tip of the, of the stigma 
starts growing and producing a pollen tube and it goes directly to where that ovule, mature ovary is and pollinates it. The minute it's pollinated, the next ovary that maturing starts sending out a signal. The next pollen tube comes down and so you've got hopefully 34 or 36 seeds pollinated in that particular pod. Uh, it's a very important signal. If there is no GABA being produced in the plant, what's going to happen? Pollen grain start, or the pollen tube starts growing down and it goes like this until it dies. It can't find the ovary to pollinate it. And here's a pollen tube, what it looks like. It's growing, as I say, it had to absorb everything from the stigma, which means that stigma had to have enough boron in it to really get this pollen tube going because boron is essential in cell elongation, the cell walls of that. If you're deficient in boron, what happens is that pollen tube expands at the tip end where all the DNA is and it bursts and you don't get any pollination. And I see that in a lot of crops. Uh, when I walk into them, especially when they're potted out, I'll pull off pods and hold them up to the sunlight to see how many blanks that I had in there. How do you get, how do you resolve it? You know, you put boron in either in the ground with a uh, bandit away from the seed because it's very mobile in the, in the ground, but it's not mobile once it's in the plant. So if you run into a shortage, you're better off putting on a foliar right at the budding stage just before flowering so there's enough boron absorbed into that stigma to make sure the signaling system works. And there's a whole bunch of others that are uh, triggered that help that whole process of uh, development of the seed, mostly for uh, uh, proteins and oil. And uh, in, that, in this case, potassium and zinc are critical. Uh, I mentioned we're all on steroids. <laughs> it's a, a fairly neat particular uh, uh, signaling system. Uh, joins a protein on the surface of the plant cell and sends signals to the cell's nucleus, causing other plant genes to be expressed, to be turned on. And phosphorus is very important for this role. And what it does is it really activates a wave of activation of other uh, growth pathways and uh, response to gravity. It knows which way is up and down, how much light, and re reduces stress in the plant. Uh, water movement. Get back to water use efficiency. Uh, it's controlled by a cell membrane gene. Uh, it produces an, an aquaporon, actually. Uh, it's a macro protein signal. And it opens or closes cell membrane water protein channels. That's how water moves within the plant, gets over to the xylem or the phloem, and away it goes. And there are 35 aquaproteins in all plants. And phosphorus is critical uh, for this process. It's part of the, I can't even pronounce the name of the pathway. I know I've got it here. <laughs> Uh, understanding those roots that I mentioned earlier and how they, how they control growth. How do you get a long, deep rooting system that's going to provide the nutrients and the water that that plant needs to operate efficiently? And it is a, a gibberellin protein signal that is critical and it controls the size of the root mare stem where the new cells are going to come from. And it's it's going to provide us with a larger rooting system that's going to be more water use efficient as well as a longer rooting system that's going to obtain the water that plant needs. And it's part of this system as well. Uh, carbon's essential. That's sort of the stomata, the little valve on the plant and the little circles in it are the guard cells. And they're open during the day. At night they'll close. So the plant will pull in enough carbon dioxide to do all the jobs that it does in the photosynthetic system. And uh, unfortunately at the same time, especially if it's warm, we're losing a lot of water vapor. So the scientists said, okay, can we find a gene that will uh, close those stomata earlier? 
Uh, yeah, they were able to do it. It closed at four hours earlier, <laughs> which is a little bit too much because then we we're uh, affecting the amount of carbon that can get in there for our photosynthetic system. And so there's going to be someone that will find one that will maybe cut it off for two hours. They know that two hours of those stomatic closing, that plant has taken in more than enough carbon dioxide to do all the jobs for the day. Four hours was too long. Couldn't get enough in there. And when the roots sense a water shortage, they send a macro protein signal to produce a particular hormone called abscisic acid or ABA. And that's, that's the real chemical that opens and closes the stomata on the leaves surface areas. And that's where the gene came in, the mutant gene. And we know that potassium is absolutely essential. Within those stomata walls, those guard stalls have a very high level of potassium in them. And calcium is also very involved in the stomata opening and closing. Uh, it, 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 all, it just, it's a nice system if we can get it to work properly. You know, when I think of water use efficiency, I go back too long. <laughs> about 52 years of working with canola. And if you look at long-term research work, we get about oh, somewhere around 2.9 bushels per inch of usable, available water out of the soil. I have clients right now that are just about at eight bushels per inch of water. So we can make that plant a heck of a lot more efficient uh, than we've ever seen. A uh, heck of a lot of it has to do with all the plant signaling systems and the nutrients that drive it. And in this particular case, potassium and calcium. Uh, it's very important on the nutrient side. We've got to understand the molecular basis of the nutrient uptakes from the roots, transported through the phloem up to the top. And just about all of this transport system is is controlled by these signals. And there are 14 genes, for example, uh, known to be involved in these transfer and uh, uh, movement of, of sulfur within a plant. Uh, and there's five groups of these cells that uh, handle it in the roots and the leaves and the stems and from cell to cell. But look at how many transporter genes there are in magnesium. How about no, uh, nitrogen, 37. Phosphorus, 142. Very complex. Where sulfur is deficient, and we see that frequently throughout the world on canola. It really costs a lot of yield loss. And uh, we know that if we have lots of sulfur put on, it's going to affect selenium and, and molybdenum. And there's certain areas uh, in this part of the world that are short on molybdenum. It's terrible taking a soil test. They're not very accurate on molybdenum. But it's something that I've, I've seen happen. I've, I've walked into a field and had plants brought into the, up to Spokane at a meeting once and said, what is this? I'm looking at it, I'm thinking group two, uh, SUs. And I'm looking at it a bit further and I still can't figure it out. So I took it to an expert. <laughs> And he took one look at it because he worked with the University of Guelph in Ontario. He said, oh, that's blind point. It's caused by a molybdenum deficiency. But he couldn't understand why it would show up down here in the Palouse. And the reason, quite simply, you've got a volcanic soil. And it tends to be low in molybdenum. Uh, but it's rather, uh, it's rather on, uneven across the area. Uh, there's a whole bunch of nutrient signals. I won't go through those too quickly. Nickel, there's two. Molybdenum, four. Manganese, um, 50. Iron, still very important. Copper, look at zinc, 1,200 <laughs> signals. And they're very involved. Like molybdenum is four very important uh, enzymes. Uh, nitri nitrate reductase, if you don't have it, you have literally no nutrition in the plant. It's extremely important in the, in the Krebs cycle and Calvin cycle to get things done and other things produced. 
There's whole numbers of genes that regulate uh, molecular processes that get very complex. And defense me me metabolites like jasmonic acid. Uh, and K is very involved in that signaling system. Again, it's a critical uh, nutrient because this is part of the defense mechanism of the plant against fungal, bacteria, viral, and insects. And we really need to keep our plants real healthy in the soil. Uh, there's copper, very important if you're looking at ergot, for example, in, in wheat. If you don't have adequate copper, you're going to have an ergot issue. So you really have to look at that. It is, it's very involved in enzyme signals, uh, such as the sicilic acid that I mentioned earlier. Uh, production response. Uh, we've got to control a lot more of these abiotic stresses, and, and that rooting depth is critical. And there may only be, if, if your plants are absolutely satisfied, there might only be three genes turned on that are active in the plant. But you put stress on it, and all of a sudden it's a cascade that's going to affect thousands of genes and turn them on, and hopefully protect the plant from stress. Uh, there's a whole thing called syst uh, system, systemic acquired resistance. I always call it SAR. Uh, and it's a phytohormone, again, sicilic acids involved. And it really helps protect the plant. And for example, you get a pathogen at land on the end of a leaf. It starts to grow. The plant identifies that it's under attack. And it starts producing a SAR signal and that signal goes to the rest of the plant and protects it. One of them is this pathway, I couldn't remember how to pronounce it, shikemic uh, acid pathway. And the key to that, you know, all you gotta do is look at that one page and you know what chemical is, nutrient is really required in this protection pathway. And it is a critical pathway for resistance to not only insects, but also to diseases. And it's the glucosinolate myrosinase system was uh, mentioned. It does uh, do a pretty good job on resistance to pathogens and insects. Unfortunately, uh, there's a whole bunch of phenols released out of the plant. And so you get a, a real uh, specialist bug that loves canola, and they smell those phenols from a thousand feet up in the air, and they come right down to the plant and attack it. So it, it works both ways. But can we change the pathway? I think we can. I think we can make a difference. Uh, did we need to have what we call them canola, low glucosinolate canola, but that's only in the seed. We've got to keep the glucosinolates in the plant because that's part of the protection mechanism. But we've got to know how it works and how the signals works, um, whether or not we can make changes to it. And so from my standpoint, it's, it's really important to understand how the signaling system works and how the hormones regulate plant growth. And I dropped some notes because I think every week that I go through research papers, I find new ones. New signaling systems, a new understanding. Here's one. It's called a single high temperature gene, and it's in Arabidopsis, this cousin of canola. And so when you have high temperatures, the plant will elongate, and it changes the architecture of the leaves. And we don't want that to happen because it's going to really slow down the growth. Even though it's growing taller, it's putting more energy and stuff into that when we want it to be producing flowers and seeds. And they found a mutant in the Arabidopsis plant that really uh, cuts down on this elongation effect and it really contributes more to yield. And so it's, a, it's good news. Uh, another study that I just got, and this one I still don't quite understand it. I tried to get Curtis over here to read it the other night and he uh, gave up. There's four institutes that had 19 top researchers working on ethylene. 
And they found that there's just a couple genes involved. Once ethylene is produced from another gene pathway. And what these two genes do is send out a wave, four waves in fact, within 12 hours, that turn on thousands of genes that really affect the growth of the plant. And the neat part of this is they've identified every one of those genes and what products they produce and it's turning on a whole bunch of other pathways to protect the plant and to help it grow. So I think that one, that one I, I'm going to follow much more closely because being in a Arabidopsis, uh, that's the one they were using for their study, there's a real good chance that we can find uh, a change that will work, a mutant, that will provide us with a different direction on getting that plant working better. And I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, quit on that note and say thank you. I uh, happen to sit on a big rock like a Chinese fellow. And uh, they do grow a lot of canola. They're the second largest in the world. And it's always fun to go over there. So thanks for your attention. I hope I, uh, I uh, provided some, something interesting. It's, it's a very complex issue, but it's very, very important to what we do. And it all comes back to balance, exactly what uh, Duane had mentioned. So thanks. I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, uh, conference. So we, had, we do have time for a question. If there is one for, for Phil, we can take it. Yeah, question right down here. Okay, what happens in a heat wave and how long does this whole pollination process happen within the flower? Uh, usually it's just two days. The first day the flower doesn't open all the way. It's only partially open. Second day it opens wide open and then it third day it stays open. By that stage already you've got uh, pollen being produced and within two days you've got all your seeds pollinated on that particular flower. And what happens with the heat? It's really that adhesive that's on the end of the stigma where the pollen grain has to allow, land and stick and that heat takes that glue effect off of there and you have no ability of the pollen sticking so you've got a blank in your plant. And you'll see it in the field when you're going through it. On the main stem you'll frequently see several. And that, that could be three or four days of over 28 Celsius. And that's when we start seeing a yield loss with high temperatures. Well, it's the most plastic plant you're ever going to grow from that aspect. It may have shut off, say, 20 or 30 flowers, but the, the plant says, well, I've got enough food and nutrients and water there, I'm going to send up more secondary branches, and I'll fill them up as long as it didn't get too hot for them. That's why we say in Western Canada, our early planted canola is going to give us consistently the highest yields possible. And we, we really have to watch those high temperatures. It's not unusual in southern Alberta to get up into the mid-80s, and that's when we're going to see a lot of effect from heat damage on canola. Uh, 